there it was, precisely 7.50 Eastern Time, as all science and space missions are precise. Watching that, there were supposed to be thousands of people in Florida to see that in person because it's such a significant moment for NASA. Of course, COVID-19 played havoc with those plans, but you can bet from all around the world, people who were involved in this mission were watching very closely. As Nicole has been telling us through the morning, those included Canadian eyes watching very closely. And what a treat to be able to bring in as part of our coverage now one of the team members who was responsible for that mission and is going to be looking forward. This is Professor Chris Hurd from the University of Alberta, team member for uh, Team Perseverance. Good morning, Professor. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm betting I was going to see a big smile on your face. You just tell me as we look at those pictures what you were doing, saying. Tell me about the whole experience that you just lived as you watched your rocket and your rover take off. Oh, I was sitting on the couch with my family. Uh, they can tell you I was kind of sitting there staring kind of, you know, just in anticipation and, yeah, just hoping that everything goes smoothly and, and so far so good. So. Big smile, underway. Start of what is to come, some exciting months and years ahead. Explain to, to people who are just joining us this morning your connection and your role on this NASA team. Uh, I'm what's known as a return to sample scientist on the mission, which means I was chosen and added to the team along with actually uh, 14 other colleagues uh, from around the world, uh, supported by the Canadian Space Agency in my case, uh, to be part of the mission. And we're all experts in what you do with the samples when they come back to the Earth. So our role is to actually help the mission decide when and where to sample rocks while we're on the surface, where Perseverance is actually going to collect those samples that, that will store on the surface that will eventually come back to the Earth. So that is the Jezero Crater. Tell me a little bit about why you've chosen that as you think the perfect spot to yield the information that you're looking for. Uh, it was chosen by the community by, um, uh, a couple of years ago, and, and it was it's because it was the site of a lake filling a cra an impact crater, 45 kilometers in diameter, and there was a river that flowed into it, and the river was carrying sediments that laid down in what's called a delta, um, and the river might uh, the the lake might have been uh, a couple hundred meters deep potentially. Uh, at one point, and we think that it, that existed, the environment existed about three and a half billion years ago. And so the really key thing there is that that's habitable, as far as we know, as far as we know for life on the earth, life could live in an environment like that. So we're going there really to see if the rocks record evidence of ancient life having existed in this crater lake. Now you won't be able to answer those questions for some time. I mean, the rocket doesn't even arrive, Perseverance doesn't even arrive until February, and then it looks like it's going to be on into maybe 2031 before the samples come back. What will you be doing in all, you know, in the, what will you be doing between now and February, I guess, w waiting, or, or, and then what happens when it lands? What then becomes your role? How is it going to evolve over the years, Professor? Well, right now, the team collectively, and I should say we're part of a team of over 300 scientists all working together on this, uh, people who are, are experts in the different types of instruments on board, et cetera. But our goal right now, in, in prior to the landing, is to continue a process where we're essentially setting up, here's where we're going to likely land, and then here's our traverse. You know, like a good geologist does, you kind of map out the traverse that you want to take. Mm -hmm. um, with the idea of here's the, the specific areas that we want to explore based on the information we have, which is mostly from, from orbit. Uh, and then, of course, after landing, there's going to be the checking out, there's going to be the, the, the cool helicopter uh, tech demo, and then, and then we'll get into the exploration part of it, which is where we'll start to drive to those spots that we've identified. Um, and then over the following um, years, it's really about trying to decide where and when to sample, but we're also the documentarians. The really key thing about these samples is that they are gonna be from locations that we get to choose very carefully, and we'll have all of the rover instruments to be able to give us the context uh, for those samples. Um, and there's lots of science, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of science that we'll be able to do with the rovers, because with the rover instruments, because it is extremely capable. We've been so talking lots of about that, that this do. morning, just how sophisticated it is and what an advance from the previous rover. So it must be very exciting in terms, from your eyes, of the potential of what you'll get. 
I thought it was interesting some of the things that I've been reading about why it's important to bring the samples back and why not just study them there, but why it's important for you to get them back eventually and to be able to study them here to answer the key questions here. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, there's. I'll, I'll say that we want a, a suite of samples of at least 20, hopefully more like 30, 35, that are really diverse, that have a wide range of rock types that will really allow, first of all, allow scientists for many generations here on Earth to study them in, well into the future, just the same way the Apollo samples have done that for the moon. But really the key thing is that if we're going to look for life and really demonstrate that life was there, the rover, as capable as it is, can only do so much. We need to have the key samples with their locations and context known uh, back in labs on the Earth in order to really test that, to really be able to say definitively yes or no that life was actually there. Answer questions inevitably, I suppose, from skeptics to come. You have it right there in hand. Let me ask you again, let's go back to the personal for just a second, because I've been reading some of the comments you've given to some of my CBC News colleagues, and I understand it was a teenage Chris Hurd who first looked at space or looked at the sky and thought, I'm, I'm interested in this. Just, just when you did that, I mean, who was this 13-year-old Chris Hurd, and, and what were the questions that you were asking and what sparked this interest? Uh, well, I, I was influenced by, by my parents. My father retired a uh, geologist and curator of the national collections for the country. And then my mother retired a children's librarian. So I was at Books and Rocks um, and I knew I wanted to go into geology. Uh, I also was reading science fiction and I, you know, it just sparked the imagination. And I, also, I thought just at that age, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing not only to study geology, but to study the geology of an entirely different planet. And Mars caught my attention right away because it is so similar to the Earth, yet so different. So imagine that. 13-year-old Chris A, wouldn't it be cool to understand Mars? And then here you are now, a member of a team that is going to give us the best chance yet of answering that very question. How are you react? How do you feel about that? How are you reflecting on that? Uh, it's it's fantastic. I mean, you can't really you can't really predict the way that things are going to go, but uh, you look for those opportunities and you work toward them, and and it just feels amazing. I mean, um, first of all, to be involved in any Mars mission, but then, uh, and as you say, to be involved in a mission where it's the first step in bringing these samples back, and and yeah, for me, it would be realizing a, a childhood dream, literally, uh, to to work on those samples once they get back to the Earth. But in the meantime, I get to help pick where they come from so <laughs> are, you a, are you a patient man <laughs> professor <laughs> well, i think you have to be really in <laughs> academia you know science does take time uh, but I'm certainly willing to wait till uh, 2031 to get those samples. <laughs> no early retirement for you <laughs> in the work to come. It's very exciting. Can we talk again? As, as I'm thinking February, once, once we get hopefully uh, landing and we'll talk about where things go from there and keep in touch with you hopefully for some time. What an exciting moment for you and your career and thank you for sharing it with us. It's a pleasure to meet you today. You're welcome. My pleasure. That is Chris Hurd from the University of Alberta, one of the team who is bringing us that moment in space exploration today.